On Thursday um, morning at 8 o'clock, I was together with uh, about 25 other ministers from the churches of Luton, um, <coughs> where we meet monthly in St. Mary's down in town. And um, it's always a very blessed time to meet like that with other people who've got the same stuff on their hearts and the same aspirations for Luton to share with them in, in, in what God is doing. And uh, the person who is leading us got us, a number of us, to read different passages from the, the, um, the scriptures to uh, kind of get us ready for this day, Pentecost Day. To, passages have been specially chosen um, because they, they speak of the work of the Holy Spirit. And you'll, of course, all know that this is the day, Pentecost Day, that Christians across the world for 2,000 years have, s have celebrated the, the birth of the Church of Jesus Christ on the occasion when the Holy Spirit was poured out in power on, on um, the apostles who were meeting like us in the upper room to pray. But in the middle of the meeting, the prayer meeting on Thursday morning that we had, suddenly one person came with a, a picture and I want to share with you this picture because immediately I heard it, I thought this speaks into what we're looking at directly. And it was a picture of Big Ben. And what was particular about this picture of Big Ben that this person had was that the hands of the clock were not there on the face of Big Ben. And that struck me as immediately significant. And since I've uh, been meditating on that picture uh, since Thursday, I was reminded uh, yesterday morning that in the church I used to serve in, in Cranbrook, um, that they had a, a wonderful clock. and They were very, very proud of the clock and its mechanism. And um, the reason they're so proud is it apparently it was um, a prototype mechanism for Big Ben itself. So people used to come from across the country to look at our clock mechanism and see how they prepared this to then do the same thing on a much bigger scale in Big Ben, anyway. So here was this picture of Big Ben, but with no hands on it. Now I want you to look up Acts chapter 1 and verse 6. Acts 1 and verse 6. This is the second book, if you like, of, of Luke. His first book was his Gospel, and the second book is the book of the Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. And here is Luke describing um, what was happening just before Jesus ascended into heaven to go back to be his father. He'd been crucified, he'd risen from the dead, and over a period of 40 days, he'd appeared to the, the Apostles. <laughs> and this was his last appearance, right? Here's Acts Chapter 1 and verse 6. So when they met together, this is the apostles and Jesus, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They wanted to know the time when God was going to restore the kingdom to Israel. In, they were very concerned about the timing of events. And Jesus' response to them is this, verse 7. He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. It is not for you to know the times or dates. And we human beings have a desire to control timing. We have a desire to control knowledge. We have a fear of things that we can't control. So we want to know what's going on. They did then, we do now. And what this, this, pas this, this picture of Big Ben was saying to me, the Big Ben with no hands, was this. As though God was saying to us, let go of the hands of the clock. Let go of your need to control time. Let go of your need to know the times and the dates of what everything is going to happen in your life. You can't know. It is unknowable, the future. So, just accept that. That's the first thing God was saying. There's more to come. 
Now, I want to look at the context, the wider context of this, and go back to that first book of Luke, his gospel, and at the end of gospel of Luke, at chapter 24, let's see what's going on then, because it's the same scene. Here's Jesus once again. He's, he's risen from the dead, and he's appearing to his uh, apostles uh, just before he returns to heaven to be with his Father. What does he say to them? Luke 24 and verse 45. Luke 24, verse 45. Then Jesus opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Jesus doesn't tell them the hour or the date. They can't get out their iPhones and put the end, a date in. Oh, we're going to be clothed with power from on high on the 25th of March. They can't do that. Jesus is quite explicit. He says, stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. It's going to happen, but you don't know when. John gospel picks up the, uh, <coughs> this theme very beautifully when Jesus tells his apostles when they're gathering together that uh, after he has suffered and died and returned to his father, his father will send the advocate, the paracletos, the Holy Spirit to be with them, the comforter. He's going to come, he's going to be sent, but again he doesn't tell them the date or the time. And <coughs> it strikes me that, and this is indeed a, a theme that is picked up, a picture that's picked up. This is, it's like a woman in labor, or a woman who's expectant of child. She doesn't, the doctors may try and tell her the day. Her husband say, what day is this baby coming on? I want to know. I'm Get the room, house ready and nappies ready and everything. But the doctors and the nurses and all the technology that we've got still cannot predict the day, can we? Why? God doesn't want us to know the day exactly than the time, okay? Because he wants us to wait expectantly. And there you see beautifully, we've, as I say, Paul, the scriptures pick up this metaphor of expectancy in Romans 8, 22. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, says Paul, waiting, groaning, in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time waiting like a woman in labor, pain, but waiting expectantly. Go back now to Acts, if you would. Here we are in the book of Acts again. Let's see how Luke, the author of this book, picks up the thread. We're going to read now from the beginning of the chapter. In my, in my former book, Theo Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up into heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait, wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So now he's made it explicit. This is what I mean when I say being clothed with power from on high. You will be filled, baptized, dunked in the Holy Spirit. 
So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you going to at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? They didn't get what he was talking about. They changed the subject. He brings them back, verse 7. He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but, verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea, all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Well, wow. and he goes on. Have a look now from verse 12. Who's there when they start to wait on the Holy Spirit? Verse 12, then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Now they're doing what Jesus told them to do. They're waiting for the Spirit to come. Those present, let's have a look at who was present. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. Verse 14, now they all joined together in constantly in prayer. Along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. I can imagine a conversation would have taken place. Should we let the women in? We've never done it before. We're Jews. Women? Well, we were the ones, weren't we, guys, who bolted the door for fear of the Jews when Jesus had been put in the tomb. And who were the ones in Camus told, told us the good news that he was risen from the dead? The women. They better come in too then, aren't they? So I imagine the scene, because this is groundbreaking stuff, guys. This is really groundbreaking stuff. Women, Jewish women praying with men in the same room. Something new is happening. The Spirit's at large already, already at work. Here they are, following Jesus' command. They don't know the time. There's no hands on the clock of the face of the clock. Yeah, they don't know the time, but they're waiting together, praying. Men and women. And then, just look over the page, because the next bit's important, bit, a little bit boring. They haven't got enough people on the PCC. Judas got into trouble and ended up hanging himself. So they have to find a new one. They cast lots, and Matthias is appointed to take his place. And so we're all ready. We've got up to 12 again. And here we go, chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together. Notice that all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and, the f and filled the whole house as they were sitting, where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be like tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in, t in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there was, I'm not going to read the whole next bit. There were, this is the bit about the, the whole of Jerusalem being full of other Jews who come from across the whole of the known world at that time for the festival of Pentecost. And there they are. And then Peter comes out to speak to them in verse 14. Peter stood up with the 11 as they go outside, raised his voice and addressed the crowd Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, and let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men, good news for you, Ted, will dream dreams. <laughs> Even on my servants, both men and women, good news for you, Cornelia. I will pour out my spirit on those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
good old God. He got the timing right. Thank goodness they didn't get an answer and say to the question, when's it all going to happen, God? When's it all going to happen, Jesus? Because he knew the right time. And the right time for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in power was the time when the city was going to be filled with about a million Jews who travelled in from, the, from all around the area, all of the countries around, ready for the festival of Pentecost. What be possible better moment could you choose for the outpouring of the Spirit and the, the, the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the crucified one, the risen one, the saviour of the world and the judge of the world. The message went out on that day. So I think the key is about waiting. For quite a time, about the last eight years, I haven't bothered having a watch. It's got me into trouble. But I was very, I've been really quite influenced by my work with gypsy people, both, both indigenous ones here in this country and other people from Romania. And they don't really do time. <laughs> they don't really do watches and chronology. And it makes life incredibly difficult. It really does. Because I have to phone them up and tell them when their doctor's appointment's coming and all sorts of stuff like that. But, in, but they have something that I want. And that's why for a long time I managed without, or didn't manage, without a watch. Because I wanted to try and get in touch with what life would be like without planning everything down to the finest detail. Do you see? Most of my life I spent practicing the clarinet, trying to get the notes in the right order, in the right place, in the right speed. Boom, 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 exactly right. So I know a lot about this. But living spontaneously and living waiting for the Spirit is something I really wanted to get in touch with. So Big Ben no hands on Big Ben. Big Ben, the icon of time in our country, but the icon also really of time looking over the whole country, next to Westminster, Houses of Parliament, next to the centre of the Church of England, the Anglican Communion, yeah? Westminster Abbey. And there Big Ben looking over it all. But now, with no hands. Everybody's wondering, the whole world is talking about whether Nigel Farage is going to take over and, and Europe will turn to the right and we'll have fascist extremism taking over everything. When's it going to happen? Everybody's wondering what's going to happen over with Russia and Ukraine. And there's memories of 1944 invasion of Normandy to put fascist extremism out of the way. Well done, Ted. But we don't know the time. We don't know the politicians and the, uh, uh, and the media pundits are trying to tell us what they think is going to happen, but we don't know. Here's Big Ben with no hands. How do you want to live your life? I was up here the other day, and I was looking out the window at Bushmead Court, and I saw a bird fly land on the top of Bushmead Court, a beautiful white bird. Bird, after a bit, flew off. And it came back and landed on the roof. Meanwhile, in the sky over there, there was a plane going. I'm sure it took off pretty much on time. The captain would have told the terminal whether it's going to be on time. They would have told, given the passengers updates on the time of arrival. Safety belts fastened, insurance in place, everything there. That's chronos time. That's time by the clock. I guess we have to have that. That's the world we live in. We can't do without that anymore. But I am envious of that bird. I am jealous of that bird. I want to learn from that bird. Because that bird hasn't got any iPhone telling it when to go and land on the roof. I wonder how the bird decides when it's going to go 
and land somewhere. Jesus, at his baptism, the Holy Spirit comes like a dove and hovers over him. And we're told that's the Holy Spirit coming and filling him. I want more of that. What's happened to our culture? What have we lost with all our technology? With all the, 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 the products of enlightenment rationalism? We get ill and we go to hospital, we get plugged up with all sorts of equipment and they tell us what's wrong. Great, I wouldn't be standing here now if it wasn't for all of that, but, but have we lost something along the road? The weather. Experts, meteorologists are still trying to predict exactly what the weather's going to be. As I came in here this morning, people were saying what the weather's like in Africa. Somebody was saying what it's like, where was it? Um, what you were saying, just in the weather, the, what's the temperature now? 33 degrees in Rome. Interesting. Can you tell when the wind's going to change direction? What did Jesus say about the wind? We don't know when the wind's going to come. And the wind is the perfect and timeless metaphor for understanding the work of the Holy Spirit. Listen to it flapping in the winds. No scientist could predict when exactly those pieces of material are going to move and how. Nobody can do it. The Holy Spirit is the Ruach that hovered over the waters at the beginning of time, bringing order out of chaos, the wind. The Holy Spirit is the Numa in the New Testament, in the Greek language. It's the wind, the breath of God, the breath of God himself. The name of God, Yahweh. 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 wind. Jesus breathed over them the Spirit, John's Gospel tells us. Holy Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost, powerfully shaking the whole place up. Everything gets shaken up. They didn't know when it was going to come. It came like a wind. Maybe it, it was a wind. I suspect it probably was a wind. What else did it come like? Fire. Fire over the heads of the apostles. Tongues of fire. Nobody could predict when this was going to happen. God didn't want them to know. And I want to suggest to you that when in the beginning, in the book of Genesis, when God says to Adam and Eve, don't eat of the tree of knowledge, he's saying there is a whole load of knowledge, but you cannot have access to it and should not have access to all of it. You should not attempt to pin down and know everything. Because if you do, it will become like a curse to you. They forbade God. Sorry. They, they, yes. They disobeyed. Thank you. They disobeyed God and they ate of the tree of the apple, of the tree of knowledge. And in that moment, they lost their innocence. And they became aware that they were naked without clothes. Something in, in, in had got lost. And we are the heirs of that something that has got lost. We have lost our innocence. And we are people of fear who want to pin everything down and nail everything down in spreadsheets and in diaries and in airport times and even down to the, mo the day when the baby's supposed to be born. Okay, it's enhanced our lives in all manner of ways. Steve could give us an exact reading of the, of the thermal efficiency of this building and he would tell us to turn our radiators down. Great! Thank you, Steve. But that's, that's not what we're here for or about, ultimately. So, what do we do then? We need to just do what Jesus said. Effectively, he's saying, to receive the Holy Spirit, to be clothed with power from on high. What a beautiful phrase that is. To be clothed with power from on high. Brother Lowe clothed himself with his African tribal kit this morning. He took this upon himself. 
Margareta said, put the jacket on. I put the jacket on. But Jesus is saying, you're going to be clothed with power from on high. And to do that, to receive that power from on high in your whole being, you need to wait. You need to wait, not knowing the time, and you need to pray. So they pray, and again and again the scripture says they were together in one place. They have no other agenda except waiting. They're not waiting for the politics to change. They're not need, needing to know. They're being told not to know the time and the date when God will restore the kingdom of Israel to them. They don't need to know. It's not the agenda. The agenda is waiting for the Holy Spirit to come in power. What do they do in response to Jesus' command? Luke 24, verse 52. They worshipped him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and stayed at the temple praising God. There's Acts 1, verse 14, tells them that there's this, they joined together constantly, constantly in prayer. So this is not something passive. This is not gathering together and putting your feet up and having a coffee, though that may be part of it. It's, gather, it, 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 it's an active waiting, not a passive waiting. And I want to put to you that I think our, in our culture, we have lost the gift of active waiting. We've become a twitchy people. We've become a twitchy people. When's my next Facebook entry coming? When's my next post coming? We're waiting on stuff that's maybe useful and important, but we're not waiting on the most important thing, are we? Have we lost the gift of waiting on God? Thursday evening, we had a meeting downstairs with the bishop, very important meeting, setting the scaffold in place to try to run the Roma church in a good way. Yesterday, the guys told me that after the Roma guys told me that after the meeting with the bishop, they went down the road to a very poor house uh, of a guy called Duca, who you'll see, who's on the street every day near the town hall begging, selling the, sorry, sell, selling the big issue. And they told me they went to his house after the meeting with the bishop and they carried on praying there till two in the morning. No other agenda than waiting on the Holy Spirit. I need to learn from that. The scaffolding's important, but the waiting on the Holy Spirit ultimately, I guess, is, is what the scaffolding's for. And what happened then at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came? This is, I think, it's just so important. The Holy Spirit came. They received the gift of tongues. They went outside and they proclaimed the good news of Jesus crucified, risen, ascended and coming again as judge, saviour of the world. They proclaimed that good news to the thousands and thousands of Jewish people out there who were living in fear and terror. Fear and terror of the Romans. When would the next suppression of their, of their, of, of their um, religious life take place? It did take place in AD 70. And thousands and thousands of them were nailed to crosses. Huge fear. Millennial fear. They'd just moved into a new, moved into a new millennium. Great anxiety. Peter and the apostles came out and the message was communicated to the people in languages they could understand through the power of the Holy Spirit. Whether they spoke other languages or whether when they spoke their own language, the other people were given the gift of understanding and they could understand in Parthenian what they were saying in, in, in Aramaic or whatever. I don't know, it doesn't matter. The fact is, the language barrier was overcome so that this good news could be passed on. Now, all of this was only possible because they had waited on the Holy Spirit. They waited 
and waited and waited until the moment came and the fruit of that waiting was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Not so that they could have a nice fuzzy feeling, though that might be part of it. Not so they could just have a, a, a good, good old worship time together, though that will be part of it. But so the good news will be carried to people who have no hope who are without God and without hope in the world, as Paul says in Romans. That's the ultimate aim. We wouldn't be here now if others hadn't done this. So my hope is that when we all gather tonight at Pentecost Praise in Kojic, in the middle of Muslim Bet Luton, we will just kind of be, not compelled, oh dear, we have to go and talk about Jesus now. Oh dear, why? I don't want to do that, I want to go home. No, but we will be impelled because the Holy Spirit will win us just to say Jesus is the Savior of the world. Let's stand.